The opinions expressed are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the official positions of the sponsors, advertisers, or presenters. Advertising does not imply endorsement by the sponsors and presenters. Hey guys, and welcome to this week's episode of the Lighting Controls Podcast. We have another fantastic guest for you today, someone who you may remember if you've been with us from the beginning all the way back to the conversation series. But before we jump into it, let me just take a minute to remind everyone that today's episode is presented by the LCA, the Lighting Controls Association. And it's financially supported by the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, or NAILED. Check out our website, lightingcontrolspodcast.com. We have all of our episodes, a news feed, as well as a merch store if you want to support the podcast. But until then, let's get to it. So today we've got Javid Butler, who you were on our show a long, long time ago in the conversation series, and we brought you back. But now this is the official Lighting Controls podcast. And uh, for those who nice. aren't familiar with who you are, do you mind just giving us a quick breakdown on who you are and what you do? So... Um... I'm a consultant. My company is uh, HC Lambda LLC, and I also participate in uh, standards development. Uh, so I have some exciting updates for you on a couple of uh, standards related to DMX 512. Uh, I uh, also contribute articles to protocol. So some of your uh, viewers may have seen uh, some of the protocol articles uh, that I've uh, written, and I am working on uh, couple of books right now, one on DMX 512 in the built environment and another on color control with LED lighting, uh, both of which have uh, been very popular topics. Well, thank you so much for joining us again on, on this podcast. I think, you know, your Love experience being. and background in the world of entertainment, color changing, DMX 512, all of those things are really important topics to discuss and you know i think on that point you know you're you're writing a book on dmx 512 in the built environment and so you know just curious uh, i'm sure a number of people who are unfamiliar with dmx might go can you really write a whole book on that <laughs> yeah the, the problem is actually keeping within the word limit that i have <laughs> <laughs> Well, so, so so give us give us a little tease of of what specifically you're talking about in this book and and what the the core sure. focus is. So um, we've had DMX five twelve in entertainment for you know going on forty years. We're getting getting pretty close to there. DMX five twelve yeah. started in nineteen eighty six, and um, it's only relatively recently that we've seen DMX five twelve really migrate strongly into the commercial environment. So uh, this this book is really oriented more towards people who are just discovering DMX 512 for the first time. Uh, there's a real difference between entertainment folks and uh, folks working in the commercial market when it comes to DMX 512. Uh, a lot of entertainment folks will say, you know, well, yeah, I use streaming ACN and I just use DMX 512 for the last mile which is perfect. That's the way you should be using it in entertainment. But, um, you know, now in the architectural market and the commercial environment, we are seeing all kinds of DMX controlled products. Uh, you know, you can go and you can get a DMX 512 downlight, right? For, mm -hmm. you know, yep. pretty effective, uh, pretty cost effective uh, solution. So yep. as well as uh, we're seeing uh, tape light, cove light, um, and just the opportunity for people to use color in commercial spaces in a way that they've never been able to do before. And um, this is really no longer um, entertainment anymore. And so it's outside of the world where you've got trained stagehands who have years of experience setting up DMX 512 systems. It's now really in the hands of architects, interior designers, um, electrical engineers, and most importantly, electrical contractors who have to get it installed correctly. And so for those folks, it's a relatively new thing. It's a, it's a new world for them. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times the conversation will start, hey, what can you tell me about this 
cool new thing I just discovered called DMX, which <laughs> it right. That's the yeah. You know, for those of us who've been using it for thirty five years plus, uh, you know, it's like well, maybe not so uh, <laughs> maybe not so new, but um, but it's new to them, and that's really what this book is about. It's uh, mm -hmm. uh, gives a little bit of the history but then talks about different applications that we're starting to see uh, DMX uh, show up in and then uh, provides some guidance for people to uh, design DMX products into their building projects and then also um, you know, help them get through those projects successfully. And so I'm curious, you know, maybe you go into this in the book or not, but um, just out of curiosity from the perspective of people who who might go well why dmx you know what is the benefit for a standard recess downlight to go dmx with its control protocol rather than zero to ten elv or dolly so with zero to ten or elv you might get um a uh, a warm dim fixture but you're not going to get full color tuning so mm -hmm. if you're looking at uh just doing warm dim then yes those other protocols are perfectly viable when you start to get into color tuning or even when you get into uh, circadian entrainment where um, you're not just doing a warm dim but you're actually doing white tuning where you've got two different emitters that you're tuning throughout the day um, things like elv and uh, zero to ten become uh, more more cumbersome uh, that you know you you have more wiring that you have to use uh, mm -hmm. you don't have individual control of each fixture it starts to get uh, fairly complicated uh, very quickly uh, it, it could work for you know relatively small space you know you get into a larger space and it and it becomes uh, more difficult so mm -hmm. for white tuning say for circadian entrainment uh, dolly is you know, still a very good choice and it's used in, in many places that starts to hit the point where DMX 512 and Dolly begin to overlap. But then when you get into color tuning, when you get into that point where you're trying to create an, an environment or an experience within a space mm -hmm. and add color, whether that's just as an accent or whether you're trying to do theming, um, that's where Dolly starts to starts to lose effectiveness, and you see DMX five twelve start to pick up, uh, primarily because of the response of DMX five twelve. It is uh, uh, a lot faster than Dolly, so you can do things like color fades, color chases, add a lot of excitement to a space, um, and uh, it's also very easy to wire. Uh, relatively speaking, if you have laid everything out correctly, when you, mm -hmm. the problems that people run into are when they haven't properly laid out a DMX system, and then they're trying to do it on the back end, and and it becomes complicated. So, yeah. um, and so, and just just gonna, right Go I'm just gonna stop you there for a second because um, you know I, I feel like there are a number of people who are going, well, how can I screw up DMX? Like, what what is he talking about? <laughs> And so I was curious if you would mind sharing like some of the the accidents that happen when it comes to DMX. Well, the biggest ones are uh, really with the wiring topology. Uh, yep. DMX five twelve is a very very robust system uh, when it is installed, for example, with the proper cable. Uh, but mm -hmm. if you don't use the proper data cable, then you wind up having problems. You know, the, the joke is that, you know, you can run DMX over barbed wire if you want to, but you're only going to go about six or seven feet, right? Um, don't, don't, don't use barbed wire for DMX. Um, and, well, and, and uh, on top of that, I've, I've heard the phrase DMX works until it doesn't. And so yep. you it may precisely. actually have a successful barbed wire installation that will work until it doesn't. Right. Like one of these days, I should probably build a barbed wire installation to show people just how far you can go with DMX over barbed wire. It's not. It's not very far. Uh, 
so yes dmx works until it doesn't and yep. in commercial construction projects everything has to be planned out in advance right it mm -hmm. if you go back and say you know oh hey we have to add a distribution amplifier here or um mm -hmm. you know we have to run more conduit that that gets to be a problem sometimes um you know particularly for example in uh, buildings that use uh, uh precast uh, concrete structures where they have to plan out every hole that they drill and make sure that it works so um it, it really does come down to the, the planning. In the entertainment environment, if you've got a flickering problem and you go, oh, you know, we're just running a little too far. Great, just grab a distribution amplifier, plug it in, boost the signal, have a nice day, right? But in the uh, commercial environment, that's not so easy. So, um, yeah. you know, planning out the run lengths, planning out the, um, number of fixtures per run. Um, I always advise to stay within the 32 limit that is mm -hmm. uh, in the DMX 512 standard. Um, are there chips now that can go more than 32? Absolutely. But you don't know what the conditions are that you're installing in. So keep it right. safe. Right? Um, yeah. So, you know, keep you the have run the, So you have the old... You have the old adage too of of copper's copper, right? And and in this mm -hmm. case, it's not. So, for those of our listeners who may not at this point, right? In case it's someone new who maybe, like you said, is just running into DMX, why is wire type so important? And what is DMX, right? Because there are listeners who actually may not know what that stands for. So DMX five twelve is a protocol that simply multiplexes up to five hundred and twelve channels onto a single data link, and that data link is based on uh, a um, industry standard protocol called or industry standard signal. It's not a protocol; it's a signal uh, called EIA four eighty five, and that was primarily designed to connect industrial equipment. Uh, it's also used to connect uh, HVAC equipment uh, sometimes within uh, commercial buildings. And the great thing about EIA 45 is that it's pretty reliable, pretty resilient, and it's very inexpensive because it is used in so many different places. And that's why we use it for DMX 512 because it's inexpensive and it's solid, it works. Um, but there are certain rules you have to follow including that it has to run on a twisted data pair and sometimes that has been a, a point of confusion less so these days but you have to use a uh, a cable that is suitable for that uh eia 485 signal uh, now fortunately there's a standard for that uh which is uh, uh ansi e 1-1.27-2 and that standard is a free download from esta.org and uh, that gives you a good basic description of what characteristics you need for that data cable that's the starting point get that right and a lot of your problems go away <laughs> well and, and i think you know the other thing here people are going to hear twisted pair if they know what that means they might go category cable or ethernet cable in in the vernacular and that's yep. a different kind of cable it it is but it turns out that category cable is even better for DMX512 than most regular 485 cables and really? that's because yeah yeah I didn't know it was better um, I knew it was a, I knew it was a standard and I knew it was applicable I didn't know in some cases it was better well, it is because what happens is, you know, you've got the twist this, you know, you've got the wires twisted together. I hope that comes through okay on the camera. Yeah. The tighter the twist, the better the noise immunity. And category cable has a much tighter twist than regular EIA 45 cable does. And so that gives it a higher noise immunity. It also happens to be that, you know, if you're sitting there thinking, uh, wait a minute, David, category cable is 100 ohms and DMX 512 is 120, you would be correct. However, 
Uh, just to 12. stop you there, we're, we're talking about impedance. If you are unfamiliar impedance, with that yes. term, you know, it, it's basically resistance on the line. But uh, so 100 ohms versus 120 ohms, it's a different level of resistance on the line. It, it Resistance is a part of it, yes. But uh, impedance changes with frequency. And so if you look at a category cable, it's meant for 10 megabit, 100 megabit data. Well, at the 250 kbit per second data rate of DMX512, <laughs> category cable is actually right around 120 ohms. So it is, it is really perfect for DMX512. The only drawback is that category cable typically is a solid conductor and yep. um, that can create problems because if you it's a very small solid conductor and that very small solid conductor can break right at the connector if you don't handle it correctly so um, a couple things that um, that work are you can use uh, splices uh, they're often called jelly beans they're little tiny connectors that uh, are a, a crimp connector that electricians use quite a bit for for data work um, and uh, you can use that to splice onto the uh, the, the category cable uh, or you could simply punch down that category cable on a standard rj45 and then just use a short pigtail that has stranded wire to make your final terminations. Um, and I've done a number of projects this way and uh, they are still working great years later. You just have to think about those things up front, plan it out up front, and then it becomes um, a very reliable way to use category cable. So, so we've gotten that, super specific and super nerdy and yeah, very yeah. focused. <laughs> I'm going to pull it back now, now that Absolutely. I feel like some people are going to be like respond, listening to this and going, what are they talking about and why are they talking about it? Well, and, and if that's the thought you're, you're going through, it, it's not as hard as we're making it out to seem. We're just getting into the, oh. the logic of why. But ultimately, you know, a lot of this stuff is readily available on, on websites yeah. and resources for DMX. So, um, Proper procedure, proper installation of DMX is actually a lot easier than we're making it out to seem. That having been said, you know, going back to this whole goal here of the book that you're writing, you know, I'm guessing you're not yep. getting to this level of detail. I, actually, I do, but um, I explain it and have pictures. So. Interesting. So, yes, I think, you know, People who are listening to yep. this, who are going, what are they talking about? This sounds like a really great resource for those people as sort of a primer to DMX 512. Mm. It, it, it is absolutely intended that way. Um, we, we have kind of skipped the, the biggest reason why contractors like category cable, uh, which is because it's inexpensive and it's yep. something they work with every day when they're yep. running ethernet inside buildings. So, you know, as opposed to an RS-45 spec cable, the contractor probably already has it on their truck. They probably have several spools of it already on their truck. And they have people who are familiar with handling it, punching it down, working with it, and yes. all of that. So it, um, uh, again, not to get too far down into the weeds, um, but, uh, uh, there, there are a lot of advantages uh, for a commercial project to using uh, category cable for, for DMX. Well, and I think, you know, one of the common misconceptions about DMX that may be persisting as a result of this this, mis this misunderstanding of, of impedance is the fact that, you know, Ethernet or category cable is just as, if not better, in, according to you, than RS-45 cable. And additionally, mm -hmm. because of that, some people might not realize that that's an option available to them for DMX. They might think you have to do RS-485. And so... Well, and let's just differentiate there 
you know, when you're pulling wire through the wall of a building, mm -hmm. Category 5 has some real advantages. You don't want to be using it on a stage production. You know, there's plenty mm -hmm. of good RS-45 spec cables that mm -hmm. um, come with 5-pin XLRs on them, uh, and they're ruggedized. You know, th those are the cables to use for production work. Uh, what we're talking about here is... Uh, doing uh, projects in the built environment where uh, it's a very different world than uh, than on stage. Um, so just just to be clear about that. Yeah, no, I, I think and that's I, a good point. Yeah, and I, and I'd I say just, too, uh, so oh, go yeah, go ahead. Um, one thing about portable cables on stage, um, hopefully this has died down, but I still occasionally hear people talk about doubling up the pairs. You know, you've got two pairs in a cable and they talk about putting both of them onto pins two and three. I have one word, don't. Um, <laughs> the reason is, and I've heard every excuse in the book. We talked a little bit about impedance and I don't wanna go into all of the explanations of impedance, but it's not like resistance by itself, right? When you double up those pairs, you actually screw up the signal because you are changing the impedance of the cable. In particular, if you have one chunk of cable that does have pairs doubled up and others that don't, you have now made the signal worse than if you didn't have that. And then the other thing I hear is uh, people saying, you know, oh, well, I do that as a spare so that if one of the wires in a pair breaks, I still have a complete other pair. No, what you have is a cable that now has a single correct pair of DMX data and an antenna that is going yep. to couple in all of the RF interference that it comes across. So again, you're only making the signal worse. The, both the RS-485 cables, well, are, particularly in the production environment, RS-485 cables are designed for DMX-512. Don't double up the pairs, just use that one pair because it is designed to work. And if you leave it be, it will work well and it will be very happy. Yep. And yeah. then you had another question. And, yeah. So like we personally in our company, we have uh, moved most of our permanent installations to category cable for DMX, right? Nice. So a lot of times we're running DMX and network in the same at to the same locations. So, you know, one of yep. the things for yep. us is we we will use a different color cable, right? So we'll use a gray cable instead yep. of a black so that we yep. can quickly differentiate between DMX and network. Um, and for anyone else who's considering category cable, like you already said, it is far less expensive to use category cable. It's, it is it is a much faster termination. If you're doing your DMX terminations and you're taking that shielded twisted pair wire and you're putting heat shrink around it like other manufacturers recommend and taking the time to do that termination, I can punch down that DMX in 30 seconds and be out of there. So there is a exactly. lot of reason to use Cat5. Absolutely. And, you know, if if your punch down tool breaks when you're out in the field, you know, unless you are in a very, very small town, somebody has a replacement, you know. <laughs> so um, there are just a lot of advantages to doing that for permanent installs, for permanent work. So, um, but, you know, this is this is what I'm explaining and, and discussing in the book and and uh, trying to provide guidance so that when you've got the the architect looking at what they want to do and then the electrical engineer trying to figure out how to do it, they have the tools to be able to lay that out. And then hopefully when it gets to the integrator or to the electrical contractor, everything is well documented and nice and clean so that the project goes smoothly. It's really when you don't have all those details sorted out up front that you start to run into trouble. Yeah, absolutely. And so now 
taking a step aside from the book and focusing on standards, you said you had some exciting news to share with us. Yeah, I do. So um, the uh, standards committee that maintains DMX 512 uh, met uh, recently in conjunction with the NAM conference. Uh, and uh, some of your uh, viewers may have attended the NAM conference or, or be familiar with it. Um, it's the, For those uh, who aren't familiar uh, with it. The National Association of Music Merchandisers is, I believe, the what the acronym stands for. Um, and uh, they have been very interested in uh, adding lighting. Uh, you know, most of the uh, attendees at NAM are musicians. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you, you know, there's, for example, a room full of metronomes that one of these days I'm going to have a chance to see just because I need to see a room full of metronomes at some point in my life. Sounds fascinating. Um, but they, uh, uh, they, they have been very interested in working with ESTA to uh, uh, provide training on lighting and to, to have uh, more of a, a lighting connection as well. So um, uh, ESTA holds uh, their quarterly meetings now while the, the winter meeting is held in conjunction with the NAM conference. And at the winter meeting, uh, a revision of DMX 512 uh, is uh, in the was voted forward, uh, as well as DMX 512 compliance. Now I'm going to start with DMX 512 compliance, and then come back to DMX, and I will do it as quickly as possible. Um, <laughs> okay. We have not had a standard for DMX 512 compliance which means that when you go out and buy a DMX 512 product, um, you're basically trusting that the manufacturer has implemented it correctly. And many of them do, and some of them don't. And sometimes it's you know, for well-intentioned reasons, but uh, long and the short of it is that, uh, you know, there are some, some things that are known to, uh, to cause DMX products to not communicate properly. And so we developed this uh, standard for DMX 512 compliance. Um, it has gone through two public reviews and it had no comments back at the end of the second public review. So it is now moving forward and uh, 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 hopefully will be approved by uh, ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, uh, within a few months there's it's it's basically paperwork at this point as opposed to any further edits to the standard um so that's going to mean that there will now be a standard that anybody can test to if they have the right test equipment but also companies will be able to send their products for third-party testing so for example when they get the ul listing on the product they can also have UL certify the product to DMX 512. And over time, that means that we're going to see better interoperability between products out there in the market. It's going to make everybody's life easier. In the process of developing the compliance standard, we found that there were a couple of things that, that we wanted to clean up in the original DMX standard. And so we did that as well. And we had zero public review comments on that. So that is also moving forward to become a revised American national standard. Um, one of the areas um, that um, in particular, uh, I, I'll avoid some of the really technical stuff because a few of the details were really, really technical. Um, but uh, for example, we added a, uh, a labeling for data loss behavior. Previously, mm -hmm. the standard basically just said that manufacturers shall declare their data loss behavior, but we didn't have mm -hmm. any standard way of describing it. So we added that um, in part to address um, emergency lighting right. because, mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Um, because the UL, the, the, the UL 924 standard requirements now basically summarized say that if it has a data loss behavior that's emergency 
status go to go to a certain intensity that meets the emergency illuminance, then you don't need a UL 924 device between the luminaire and the control system to sever that connection. You actually, well, um, it's a very simplified. Yeah. Yep. Um, what, what this will allow is that um, if you have a UL924 device that does break the data line, you don't have to have a separate UL924 listing on the light fixture. Mm -hmm. And that's been mm -hmm. problematic for... That's right. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that's been problematic because, uh, you know, getting UL924 on a light fixture is a relatively expensive process. And that's fine if you're talking about an emergency light such as a troffer, right? Where you're making, where the manufacturer is making millions of them every year, right. and you know it becomes a relatively small adder. Now you talk about a DMX downlight or something like that, and that's a much bigger cost relative to the the number of fixtures that you're going to sell. So this uh, um, now I, I I should be careful because. Um, the final revisions to the electrical code haven't been published yet, but uh, basically the way that uh, everything is heading is that this revision in DMX is now going to enable fixtures to be used as emergency lights with what looks like the new language that we're going to see in the electrical code. So it's going to make our lives easier is what it comes down to. Um, so very excited that, that both of those standards are moving forward. Uh, again, they have not been finally approved yet, but, um, basically at the point where there are no further public review comments, then, uh, it largely becomes a matter of, of paperwork to get it done. So well, very excited. This is, you know, it's really exciting to hear about this because I think one of the challenges from a specifier's perspective was always how do I ensure that the manufacturer is meeting DMX requirements? And yeah. part of that just became experience. You know, oh, I know this manufacturer does this, does DMX this way. And so I need to treat it this way versus that manufacturer. Whereas now with a compliance standard, that really ensures this consistency that wasn't always there. That was exactly why I put the last five to seven years of my life into that, because <laughs> having, having that consistency, you know, and it'll take a while for, for fixtures to get listed and, and yeah, uh, sure. But, um, uh, uh, but the other nice part is that uh, the compliance standard is written in, in such a way that uh, manufacturers don't have to start only with new products. They could take their existing products and just start by running the tests internally. You know, they could just mm, yeah. do all of the tests themselves and see how they're doing and maybe just do a firmware upgrade. And, um, you know, they don't have to send it off to a testing laboratory to, to figure out whether or not they potentially have issues or not. Yeah, so and it's great to hear this because it's it, it's hopeful that we'll start to see not just the big players, right? Because as, as I'm sure you are both very well aware, a lot of the issues in the field mm -hmm. is from the $5 DMX driver that the contractor bought online because it said it was a DMX driver yep. and it's just, you know, right, whether it's white or terror, color changing, didn't matter. And not all DMX drivers are created equal. This should hopefully start to level the playing field and eliminate a lot of those issues that we see from, you know, not so reputable manufacturers making drivers. Well, and as manufacturers start to even do self-testing on their own products, when you have a light and a driver or a controller and a driver that are put together on a job, then all of a sudden, if you do have that problem and one of the products has been certified, or at least the manufacturer has gone and done the testing themselves, um, 
it'll be a lot easier to resolve that responsibility because you know the the first thing that happens when you have a, an issue with DMX products in the field is this right everybody's pointing yeah. fingers at each other um yeah. so that should that should help quite a bit um it, there's also a section just on uh best practices for dmx 512 um and we wrote that as a separate section so it can be the kind of thing that you can just print out hand to the electrical contractor and say you know here's here's some training you know maybe along with a copy of my book but um uh, <laughs> the information is there well and and so i mean i think that's the other thing that's fascinating about dmx is the fact that there's a lot of resources out there that people could accidentally put in their heads as optional rather than strongly <laughs> recommended because mm -hmm. when you don't make it a standard it's not a requirement and when it's not a requirement it kind of gets sort of put on the back burner for focus so as a result you know i think people who do want to learn about DMX, there's a whole host of resources out there. Or as people who are being required to do DMX, but don't understand it and don't really want to invest mm -hmm. the time, you know, that's another argument to be made for compliance standards because of the fact that, mm -hmm. you know, yes, there is a wealth of knowledge out there to talk about DMX, but best practices are not requirements best practices right. in people's minds are, okay, it's a, it's a good idea to do this. But when talking about best practices for DMX, at least in, in my mind, and, and I don't know if it's the same in, in both of your minds, but that is basically saying, read this before doing anything. This is your instruction guide. Mm -hmm. It, it at least gives a starting point. Um, right. Yeah. If, if it leads people to start asking some of the right questions, then the then the job is done, right? Because <laughs> it's when people don't ask those right questions up front and yes. then go ahead with something, maybe using the wrong wire or cable, um, you know, running things inappropriately, that's where you run into problems that you have to fix down the road. Yeah, what it's the what what is this terminator thing and why do I need it? What, what I don't understand. <laughs> well, and all right, so we're almost out of time here, but I I just want to kind of encapsulate this cuz I think this is all fascinating and and excellent stuff, but I think some people may have gotten dizzy with the technical lingo <laughs> that we've been th throwing at them. Um, but as far it's as It's not that going, hard, guys. It's not. It's really not. And, you know, if we have made it seem a lot harder, I apologize. I really hope that people who are unfamiliar with DMX 512 won't reach out and, and ask for more because there is plenty and we're happy to, to go over this with you. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Javid and I have, have had hours long debates about DMX. So, but, um, you know, basically DMX 512, digital multiplex, 512 multiplex addresses, um, being sent down the same line. It has its very specific needs. Um, that's why, you know, Javid here is writing a book on it for permanent installations because of the fact that in a, an entertainment environment, it's a very flexible resource because of the way that it's installed. But in a permanent uh, commercial installation, you really need to lay it out precisely beforehand. Otherwise, you can run into real trouble, especially if you don't use the right cables or you exceed limitations like distances or devices. Yep. Um, but mm -hmm. the really good thing is when it comes to devices anyways, there is going to be a compliance standard coming out to vet all of those devices so that, you know, <clears throat> as Javid alluded, alluded to earlier, they're, they're Technically, 32 devices maximum per daisy chain isn't really the, the hard limit, but definitely a best practice to stay within that number. But the compliance standard will at least enforce that, you know, it doesn't drop below that, for instance. Um, yeah. you, you wanted to correct well, that? I wanted to add to that because... Yes. Um, you know, talk with the manufacturers, you know, work mm -hmm. closely with them. Um, 
if you don't know for sure, if the manufacturer hasn't given you other information, think of 32 as a hard limit. If the yep. manufacturer is taking responsibility for a layout and they put more than 32 on there, well, now it's shown on the drawings, right? So now you have their submittal package where they show more than 32. And if it doesn't work, then they need to send a tech out into the field to figure out how to make it work, right? Sure. But stick with that 32 if you don't have that, that documentation, if you don't have that data. Absolutely. And, and on that on that point, I mean, manufacturers and manufacturers reps, when they're dealing with DMX, for the most part, try to do a hands-on approach with their mm -hmm. designers if they're unfamiliar with DMX 512. If they aren't, if they're super savvy with DMX 512 and they've worked on several projects together, then they'll probably have shorthand and they'll, they'll breeze through it. But um, for the most part, you know, a lot of reps and, and manufacturers like to make sure that the projects are successful. And so as a result, they will try to check that people know what they're talking about when it comes to DMX 512. Um, but again, with these, with this new standard and with the new um, standard for DMX 512 in, in general, there is a lot of movement to ensure rather than just ask that things are being followed. Um, yep. And additionally, you know, with the new standard revision for DMX 512, I, I just wanted to correct the, the misspoke, misspeaking, spoken uh, thing that I said about UL 924. You know, technically what I said wasn't incorrect, but the more correct thing would have been to say was what Javid said, which is that it's about the UL 924 listing on the Luminaire itself. And so with that revision in DMX 512's standard, it aligns better with the new UL 924 standard, which is basically saying, you know, data loss behavior, if you lose data running to that fixture, um, you know, it will have this behavior that is more closely aligned with UL 924. So it doesn't need to be listed as UL 924 Luminaire. Yep. And, and if folks have questions, I would say they should just reach out uh, because it, it is a fairly complicated thing. Um, yes, yes. And, and, and there were a lot, a lot of discussions about the best way to handle this. Um, and I'm pretty happy with, with what we came up with because it's something that specifiers can easily work with and, uh, and get right. Yeah, uh, well, David, Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. I, I just want to take one second to remind everyone that while, you know, these standard revisions are coming, especially when we get into emergency lighting, it is so code driven that please, please, please pay attention and ask where, you know, where based on where you are, which version of the code they are going by, which because version? that will drive how you deal with directly controlled luminaires for UL 924. So just Absolutely. everyone remember while we're talking about this making it easier, there are still existing projects where you may have to conform to existing code that you have to deal with. So if you are confused about those, reach out to your rep, reach out to your manufacturer, reach out to any one of us. There are a million good resources for dealing with emergency lighting, but we do understand that it can be a touch complicated with DMX emergency lighting. Well, and on, on that point, I'm just going to jump in briefly to mention that um, Ron and I have started a committee under Nailed that is going to be talking about startup tech and integration procedures and giving guidance and definitions for all of these things, which are going to support the world of DMX as well as other protocols and signals out there. So um, definitely check, check it out. We've got some information out there for it, but it's growing. It's very small right now, but, um, you know, if there are people out there who are passionate about this, please reach out and, and join the committee. We would love to have you on board, but I'll, yes, I'll let absolutely. Ron take over here. Yeah, yeah. So no, that's great. It's it's We would, we'd love to have you. David, thank you so much again for coming on. It's great to hear about all this stuff happening. And I, I do apologize, like Webster said, for anyone who felt like we got in the weeds a little bit there, but we all kind of oh, geek out with DMX 512 a little bit. <laughs> no, we didn't, but. It's, it's not hard to do sometimes, but thank you again. And I just want to remind everyone that today's episode is presented by the LCA, the Lighting Controls Association. And it's financially supported by the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, or NAILED. Check out our website where we have all of our 
episodes, a news feed, and a merch store. It's lightingcontrolspodcast.com. Until then, we'll see you. Thank you so much for joining us. And, Javid, really always a pleasure to have you on. And we'll have you on when your book comes out, too. Thank you.